الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you for attending this evening public lecture organized by Mu'is Academy. May I request everyone to be seated as, as we will begin our program very soon. May I also request that we put all mobile devices to silent mode to facilitate the smooth running of the program. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Announcing the arrival of President of Mu'is, Haji Muhammad Alami Musa, Chief Executive of Mu'is, Haji Abdul Razak Marika, Sahibu Samaha Mufti of Singapore, Dr. Muhammad Fatris Bakaram, Deputy Chief Executive of Mu'is, Dr. Al Bakri Ahmed, and of course, our guest speaker, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, President of Zaituna College. Thank you. President of Mu'is, Haji Muhammad Alami Musa. Chief Executive of Mu'is, Haji Abdul Razak Marika. Sahibu Samaha Mufti, Dr. Muhammad Fatris Bakaram. Deputy Chief Executive of Mu'is, Dr. Al Bakri Ahmad. Our eminent speaker, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I begin with greetings of peace. And a very good evening to all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Shamim Sultana, and I warmly welcome you to Mu'is Academy's public lecture entitled Reimagining the Role of Islam for the Future. Mu'is Academy is the research and education arm of the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore. The Academy aims to develop forward-looking Muslim thought leadership so as to shape a thriving religious life for the Singapore Muslim community. Over the past few years, Mu'is Academy has embarked on a journey in developing public discourse series to nurture critical conversations on the role of Islam and Muslims and their positive contributions to the modern world. The themes that we will focus on this year are Islam in the age of deglobalization, as well as developments in Islamic thoughts, rethinking traditions, and reform. The lecture is testament to our efforts in moving towards the goal of being a community of excellence. Tonight, we are very honored to have with us Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, an internationally renowned scholar of Islam, and he will explain the role and place of Islam in all societies and the future and the way forward for Muslims living in such challenging times. The chairperson tonight is Deputy Director of Capacity Building and Interfaith Engagement and Vice Dean of Mu'is Academy, Dr. Muhammad Hanan Hassan. Without further ado, please join me in inviting our chairperson, Dr. Hanan Hassan, for his opening remarks, Dr. Hannan, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. His Eminence, uh, Sheikh uh, Hamza Yusuf, Hafizahullah, and uh, Umu Yahya wife of Hamza Yusuf, I think I need to acknowledge that because I think I strongly believe that uh, we will not be where we are now, especially at least for me, without my wife. So his wife is also an important part of uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's life. Uh, Ms. Yoshi Han, Permanent Secretary of MCCY, President of uh, Islamic Justice Council of Singapore, Hajali Musa, 
Chief Executive of uh, Islamic Justice Council of Singapore, Haji Abrazak Malikar, Sahib Sama Mufti, friends, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh, and a very good evening to all. At this point, I remember a, a conversation I had some close to three decades ago with one of my professors. Uh, because I asked him, why did you do a PhD dissertation of 500 pages on Al-Waw Fil Quran al Karim? The letter Wow. And he, tell, he said this to me, he said, Hanan, do you know that this letter has caused a lot of confusion and problems in understanding Al-Quran al Karim? Because out of the 6,000 plus verses in Al-Quran al Karim, wow is used more than 9,000 times. And they have different meanings. And I can tell you it has different meanings. From one wow to another wow. And I shall not give you a lesson on semantics or nahu here, but uh, if, if only you look at the, Islamic, uh, the, the Arabic uh, word of wow, it carries a lot of meaning. It's a conjunction, it's a preposition, it can be many other things. And it has caused a great deal of confusion and misunderstanding of Al Quran Karim as well as our tradition. If you look at our typical old Arabic manuscript like this, this is manuscript of uh, Fatul Wahhab, of, 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 uh, of Zakaria and Sari. You cannot make a distinction between the original writing of the Sheikh and the insertion, edition, and you don't have commas, periods, paragraphs. It's very difficult to read, let alone the, the writing and all. This is an example of another manuscript, which has caused a great deal of confusion. This is what we call the Fatwa Mardin of Ibn Taymiyyah, the manuscript. And how one single word has caused a great deal of confusion between an yu'amal and an yukhata. It takes an expert, a specialist, to be able to read these things. Now, I'm only, talking about, I'm only talking about the form, not yet understanding the content. Even the, in terms of the form, and this is another, and I have plenty of them. But before, before it reaches to the form that we are so used to, the published computer, new phones, beautiful phones, from one stage to another. And between that earlier stage to the published, as we know now, uh, there's a serious gap that we need to reconsider the way we deal with our, our text. I'm here, I'm talking only about the forms, not yet the content and the meaning of the content. So then, what awaits us in the future? Our tradition from the past to what it is now and to the future. And for that, we are fortunate to have among us this very evening, our eminence, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who is well grounded in our classical traditional texts, as well as the modern sciences. And to help us understand better our, our classical texts, our traditions, and to help bring us to, to the future, to reimagining the role of Islam, to exercise our critical reading of our texts, to be creative, innovative and transformative in discussing about some of these difficult concepts and ideas. But you are here not to listen to me, so I shall not take much of your time. I'm looking forward to listening to uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, and it gives me great honor tonight to invite uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf on the stage to speak to you on the topic that's mentioned. Sheikh Hamza, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira 
الحمد لله سلامت ملام الحمد لله first of all تريم كاسي for the introduction and that's almost the extent of my Malay um, but uh, I I want to say about the wow that people uh, in in my country when 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 you're really stunned about something you say wow <laughs> and so uh, I think the the wow in the Quran is a real wow because uh, like you said it's a very difficult uh, letter in fact the, the the last stage of great scholarship in the Arabic language is called Mughni al-Labib. You know, this was the book that traditionally scholars studied as a as kind of the culmination of their study and mastery of Arabic. And it's a, a book simply written on the prepositions and the particles in the Quran because they're extraordinarily complicated. And we tend to forget how complicated language is and how difficult it is to communicate. One of the great miracles of life is communication itself, the, the ability to actually speak with one another and to exchange meanings, because meanings are so uh, extraordinary, uh, symbols, and, and the fact that we are symbol makers. One of the, I was going to do a PowerPoint, but I'm just gonna forego it because I thought about reimagining uh, my lecture because we're reimagining the future of Islam. So um, it, it's a long uh, PowerPoint and I think I would rather um, speak directly to you and then um, open it up for questions and maybe some short comments. But I want to thank uh, the, um, the, the ministry uh, for, uh, for their presence, uh, the Ministry of, of Culture and Communications there, and also to the Mufti of Singapore, um, uh, Sheikh Bakaram, and also to the President of Muiz for the invitation and for the incredible hospitality, and also for the extraordinary um, organization that I witness here. It's, it's really impressive to see uh, what we call itqan, uh, in our in our action, which is related to ihsan, also the Prophet loved ihsan, which is making things beautiful. Nobody had to put an extraordinary array of flowers in front of this stage, but somebody just thought, wouldn't that be nice? It would make it more beautiful, and that's something that humans do. For some reason, we we're almost compelled to make things beautiful, and what is that? When I was in West Africa. Uh, I was struck by the fact that the Bic pen became very widespread in Saharan uh, Mauritania, where I studied. But they would always embellish it with uh, colored leather strips as a cover. Because, and I asked why, and they thought it was ugly, the Bic pen. So they wanted to embellish it. Uh, it's very interesting because one of the things about Western culture now, even though traditionally we had a, a, a a real love of beauty, much of Western culture has become very ugly and very functional. In fact, clothes now, people, wealthy people spend an extraordinary amount of money for rags, clothes that have holes in them, um, that many people now, uh, instead of uh, adorning themselves as most traditional cultures, including the, the uh, Malayu culture, uh, adorn their clothes with beautiful embroidery or color, now they, they actually relish a, a type of ugliness in their clothes. And for the first time in human history, people wear underwear as just clothes to wear outside, like t-shirts. T-shirts were traditionally underwear. So it's one of the fascinating things about modern people is that we're losing beauty. We're losing a sense of beauty. And, and for me, that's a very dangerous indication of where we're going as a species and as a civilization. The most beautiful thing that human beings have is language. And the most beautiful language that we have historically was poetry. And every culture is built upon poetry. There is no human civilization that does not have poetry at the foundation of its civilization. There is no Plato or Aristotle without Homer. Plato and Aristotle do not exist without the great uh, poetry of Homer in the Iliad and the Odyssey. 
there, there is no uh, King James Bible without the great Elizabethan poets. It was the great poetry of Elizabethan English that enabled the King James Bible to come into existence. And even though we believe the Quran is the eternal word of God, uh, as Muslims, those of us who are Muslim here, believe that, nonetheless, the Arabic poetry reached its pinnacle at the moment the Quran was revealed because the Quran cannot be understood without incredible linguistic skills. And so there is a reason why nobody in the history of Islam has ever been able to reproduce the poetry of the Jahili Arabs. It's considered the pinnacle of Arabian language at the moment that the Quran came down. One of the hallmarks of modern society is the loss of poetry. And this is a very, another very deep sign that something's wrong with us as a species. In my country, um, there's something called rap which is undeniably has a poetic element to it. But one of the things about poetry, traditional poetry, is it was always a rigorous discipline. And some people had it naturally, as in oral cultures, but generally it was something that had to be studied, what they call prosody, or the science of metrics. And this is true in uh, all cultures have a metrical poetry that is either related to accent or time. And, and, and these are the, the, the two interesting things about language. Uh, the English language is largely spoken in iambic uh, uh, accent, a, a light heavy. So you have, you, you have uh, Shakespeare who largely wrote in iambic pentameter. But the natural, a lot of people who read Shakespeare don't realize that it's poetry because it's so natural. To be or not to be, that is the question. People don't realize that that's actually beautifully metered in an iambic pentameter because it's the natural way that we speak. And so there's something about the beauty of language that poetry is an aspiration of every civilization. And poets were incredibly honored in cultures. Uh, the great poets of uh, Arabia, the, the, the tribes would celebrate uh, the birth of a poet because they were elevated by the poets. And so it was something that was, was very, very important. Um, the last, arguably one of the last great poets in, in American civilization was, uh, was Robert Frost, who was honored by Kennedy at the inauguration uh, as, as being a poet to inaugurate his presidency because Kennedy had a great love of poetry and, and um, educated people traditionally uh, were forced to study poetry. So, that's one of the important things that I'm seeing in the world is this loss of the rigor of poetry and the meanings that are infused in poetry. And when, 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 when language is honored, poetry is honored. And when language is denigrated, a poetry loses its import in a society. People lose interest in poetry. But poets have much to tell us. Uh, Poetry, the reason, according to Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, the reason that the poets, um, the prophet was called a sha'ir, um, uh, Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, a great Algerian uh, sheikh, said, is because no one uh, other than a poet has a type of inspiration that is very close to revelation that there's a relationship between the inspiration of a true poet, not somebody who writes verse, but a true poet, an inspired poet, and somebody uh, who has inspiration from God. And this is why the language of Revelation is always an exalted language. And, and although we don't call the Quran poetry, uh, you know, uh, you know, that we didn't teach him poetry, that in Surah Yasin, Allah says, we, we did not teach him poetry, and it wasn't appropriate for him because of the relationship, uh, according to Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi, because they can be confused. And so uh, that's something that our modern education uh, is very often lost on people, the importance of embedding meaning in language, that poetry is difficult to understand because it teaches people how to meditate on meaning. And I will give you one example. 
My father once told me that it took him almost 50 years to understand one poem of Robert Frost. He had memorized it and meditated on it for that long. And during the last uh, days of his life, he was discussing that poem. I'll give you one example. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to say that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. What Frost is talking about there is the essential human problem, what are called the hot sins and the cold sins. The hot sins are sins like human appetite, the, 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 the desire to consume, ahlektu madan lubada, this desire to consume, the desire to, uh, to explore sexual appetite without limits, the desire to eat without boundaries. Much of the world right now that's called uh, developed or advanced is deeply embedded in appetites. They're literally destroying themselves with the sins of fire. And if you look at the inequality on this planet, in the other places, it's the cold sins that are eating them up, the sins of hatred, the sins of resentment, the sins of envy. These are cold sins. And what he's saying is, I think it's fire that's going to destroy us. It's our human appetites because they override our reason. This is called the concupiscent soul in traditional ethics. But it might be the irascible soul. It might be the, 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 the emotional soul of anger. But both of them suffice. Both of them will do it, do the job. And the only thing that can override fire and ice in the human being is, is reason. Is, is the actual intellect. And this is why every culture traditionally honored intellect. We now know Aboriginal peoples always had wise people that they recognized and deferred to. So even at the Aboriginal level, Orang Asli, these people understood the importance of wisdom. And their intelligence is not less than the intelligence of, of advanced people. We know, we know that the idea of homo sapiens sapiential beings, beings of intelligence, that, that Aboriginal peoples in some ways, th they can adopt and learn our advanced civilizations very quickly. And, and they've proven that in many places. But it's very difficult for an advanced civilized person to adapt to an Aboriginal condition. They, they will perish in those conditions. And so that's another aspect of our of our species is that these people are very important. These people were natural conservationists. They conserved uh, their, their, their water resources. I'll give you one example. It, I was in Mauritania, one of the students. We, 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 our, our, our student housing was burlap sacks, burlap sacks that were sewn together by the women. And then we took branches of trees and built what they called a hosh. And this is how the students lived where I studied in the Sahara. Very poor people. But one of the Americans came to study there after me. And he went and he was trying to cut down a tree. And one of the illiterate people, when he saw him doing that, he ran to catch up with him. And when he caught him, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm cutting the tree down. He said, what for? And he said, to build a hosh. He said, no, no, no. Take a branch from this tree and then go take a branch from that tree and take a branch from that tree. Don't take the whole tree. <laughs> that man should be in, in the United Nations teaching them about environmentalism and how to preserve our natural resources because this consumption and overconsumption, we have a crisis all over. In America, nobody thinks about tap water. They just let it run while they brush their teeth. Our prophet said, conserve energy, uh, conserve water, even if you're on a river, a flowing river. Be, be cons conservative in your use of water. Why would he say that? They're living in the desert, and they would think, oh, it's because it's not abundant. But even when it's abundant, you shouldn't be wasteful. The Quran says, don't be wasteful. 
كُلُوا وَشَرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Eat and drink, but don't be wasteful, because God doesn't love wasteful ones, the extravagant ones. In, 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 in the seven deadly sins, the great sins of St. Gregory, the Pope of the Catholics, in his seven deadly sins, luxuria in Latin is one of them. The sin of luxury, which is translated into lust. But this, this love of luxury, this desire that, that we get more and more and more. When is enough enough? Because it's never enough if that's your pursuit. You'll never be satisfied. The human soul will never be satisfied. It'll never be enough. But the great sin of our time, in my estimation, especially amongst the young people, many of them right now are on their cell phones, I can see. The great sin of our time is distractibility. This is called acedia in the seven deadly sins. The sin of acedia was the sin of distractibility. The, the great desert monks called it the noonday devil. And, and they, they said that its quality was always to be the monk, instead of meditating, he'd go look to the window to see if anybody was passing by. He'd listen to see if anybody was in the corridors. Like people now check their cell phone to see if they got a, an email or a text or a WhatsApp. That people now are losing the ability just to sit and be patient and think deeply about things. Boredom is very important. The quality of actually being bored is very important. Malal. It's very important to, because this is what gives us creativity. It's the ability to just think about things. But now, everybody has these machines, so they're never bored anymore. Ne they never are left to their own devices to think of something. One of the most intriguing ayahs in the Quran for me is that God said he didn't create this as entertainment. And he said, and if he was going to entertain himself, he would do it from within himself. In other words, he wouldn't create us like a television show to watch. If he was going to entertain himself, he would do it from himself. And this is what creative people do. They don't need to seek an outside of themselves. They're creative in their own right. And this is more than any other time in human history we need creativity because we are confronted with problems that have never confronted the human species. We have the problem for the first time in, in our human history, we have the ability to destroy ourselves. When the nuclear bomb was unleashed, and, and, and the Japanese people who are, in a sense, your neighbors in Asia, the Japanese people felt the brunt of two nuclear bombs. And they still have people alive that have the, the effects of those bombs. They are the most vociferous people against the proliferation of, of nuclear bombs because they know the meaning of it. They know what it means. When, when the bomb was unleashed on this world, and, and the Americans did it, when the bomb was unleashed, Einstein said, the world has changed, but we have not changed. We must think anew. And this is one of the arguments of Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya about Islam, that we cannot contextualize Islam in the seventh century. Our Prophet ﷺ lived in the seventh century. But we live in the 15th century according to our Hijra date and in the 21st century according to the Common Era or in the, in the year uh, Anno Domino according to the Christians. This is a different time. It's a different place. The principles we believe are, are valid because the Prophet ﷺ gave universal principles. But the particulars are not always valid because many of the particulars were that time and that place. So the idea now of jihad, a talab, many Muslims still believe in this idea of, of preemptive jihad, that you, you, that, that, that you have an offensive jihad. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya said that in the early period of Islam, this was a khilaf. It was an issue of difference of opinion. Some of the ulama said no, like Ibn Taymiyyah said, all jihad is defensive. There is no offensive jihad. That was the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah. Some of the ulama said no, like the Malikis, the, the school I studied, the, the madhab I studied said, al-jihad wajibun marratain fisana, that you have to fight jihad twice a year. And this is in our books of fiqh. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya says that anybody that's calling to that now, nahkumu alayhi bil junoon, that will consider them uh, clinically insane. 
And he's not joking because the world has changed. For the first time in human history, mosques are built all over the world, including Singapore, which is a secular society that honors its Muslims. Mosques are built here. The Muslims are honored in this country, even though the people that are ruling the country, by and large, are not Muslim. There are, there are some Muslims within the government, but the majority of the government is not Muslim. But they're saying, we, we, we honor you. We honor your religion. We honor the Buddhists. We honor the Hindus. We honor the Christians. There are 10 official religions in Singapore. This is the world that we need to promote today. We're not in the world where the Arabs said, Rome, إِذَا لَمْ تُغْزَ غَزَتْ Europe, if you don't fight it, it fights you. This was the pre-modern mentality. And colonialism might have proved that, that opinion. But today, we now have international agreements. Singapore, the, the British left. This is an independent state. Malaysia is an independent state. Undeniably, there's still influences by the great powers. The G7 have powers that other countries don't have. They influence the United Nations and these things. That's true. And also the GDP of America is the largest in the world. So that's going to have an impact on the world. It also has the, the most powerful uh, military for good and for bad. Some of the things that it does, like monitoring the sea lanes of communication, preventing piracy, many of these things are beneficial to, to our, our societies. And then there are other things about foreign policy that can be very unfortunate. But overall, we have a global order. If we did not have this order, if this order collapsed, then we see the anarchy of the Middle East, where one country eats up another country, or one group becomes a criminal group that begins to terrorize other groups. The Yazidis have been protected in the Muslim civilization for centuries. And suddenly, they're, be take, they're be, being taken as slaves sexual slaves in some cases. This is completely antithetical to, 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 to basic human decency, let alone a world religion that convinced billions of people over human history of its truths, including the South Asians, who, who at, at the essence of your culture is, is, is adab, is this idea of, of comportment and decorum and courtesy. And this is your civilization. Islam came here as a peaceful religion. They didn't conquer you with their swords. They conquered the people that became Muslim in this region with their, with their hearts. And this is one of the beauties of South Asian Islam, is that it's an Islam that, that wasn't spread by the sword. It was spread by peace. Now, in our tradition, we don't believe Islam spread by the sword because we have no indication that the Muslims forced people to become Muslim. And in the few instances when they did, actually the, the caliph, when he found out, allowed the people to revert back to their religions because they considered it coercion. And the Quran has a principle, la ikraha fid deen. There's no coercion in the religion. Now, in terms of, and, and I'll conclude with this, in terms of reimagining the future, the first thing we have to do is stop being nostalgic about the past. One of the interesting things about Muslim societies is there's never been a successful science fiction television program. Star Trek doesn't work in Arabia because Muslims can't imagine the future. They're so nostalgic for the past. And this is one of the tragedies of the modern Muslim community. They're always talking about the past, how great we were. This is what one of the poets, he said, Asbahtu kuntiyan wa asbahtu ajina wa sharru khisal al-mar'i kunti wa ajinu. I've become somebody that said, I used to and I did in the past. And, and he said, and that's the worst type of person that talks about the past. Aristotle said that, that young men talk about the future because they have no past. And he said, old men talk about the past because they have no future. And the Muslim civilization is like an old man. But we're not. We're filled with young people that need hope, that need aspirations, that need to actually think that the future can be better. And one of the most extraordinary hadiths in our tradition is the Prophet said, Ummati ka matar. My ummah is like rain. You don't know if the first of it is the best or the last. So we should always be optimistic 
and hopeful about the future. We should never despair. Don't despair of God's grace. We are confronted with immense problems. Your community is one of the few communities. I'm talking to the Muslims now. Your community is one of the few communities that is living in real security. And you have to thank God for that. And then you thank the, the, the government. Man nam yashkuri nas, lam yashkuri la. Whoever is not grateful to, to people has not thanked God. And this government is, wants to maintain security in their, in, in their country. I'm not going to criticize the government, but I guarantee you, if I studied the situation here enough, I could do some criticism. All right, Because there is no government that's perfect. There never has been, and there never will be. But if you're grateful for what you have, God will increase it. Your Lord has declared, if you're grateful, I will increase reasons for being grateful. There's something called mafhum and mukhalafa, right? So if you're ungrateful, I'll give you more reasons to be ungrateful. And so acknowledging that there are much room for improvement in any state, you have one, one of the most flourishing states in the world. And I'm telling you as an American who's watching my own civilization really, really struggle right now, morally, uh, financially, um, racially, uh, in many, many ways. We're, we're having great struggles. So hold on to your culture. Don't recreate yourself in somebody else's image. The Muslims here should not become Arabs. The Arabs are Arabs because they're Arabs. You're Malayu because you're Malayu. Every culture is distinct and unique. Our Prophet ﷺ honored cultures. He spoke to every tribe in their dialect. Why did he do that? Because he was honoring their culture. When the Yemenis came, he said, they were fasting and traveling. He said, Laysa minum bir musiyam fim safar, o kamaqal. He spoke in a Himyari dialect. Why would he do that? Because he wanted to make them feel, I'm one of you. I'm not different from you. And now we have Muslims from indigenous cultures that adopt the clothes of another people, that adopt and, 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 and in the great book of the Shafi'i scholar, Al-Mawardi, he said, مُخَالَفَةَ الْعُرْفِ فِي اللِّبَاسِ مِنَ الْحَمَاقَةِ وَالسَّفَحِ That to go against the culture of a people in the way they dress is from stupidity and foolishness because you alienate yourself. Now, obviously, if you're a visitor to a country and you're wearing your traditional clothes, that's another thing. But when you live amongst a people, you should dress like the people. And this is why the Muslims have always dressed like the cultures that they lived in. Obviously, there are modest issues. There are, there are issues of modesty because we, we adhere to modesty. But honor your own culture. These are your people. And you should be proud of your culture and your people. Don't, don't lose sight of who you are and try to be somebody who you're not. Our prophet wore clothes from Yemen, from Ethiopia, from the Byzantine. He had a Byzantine robe that was dayyq. Like it's, it's almost like Europeans always have had tight clothes. But he had one that had uh, the akmam or dayyqa. Why did he wear clothes from other cultures? That wasn't the habit of the Arabs. I believe he did it because nobody could say, this is the sunnah of the Prophet in clothes. Wallahu alam. Jazakumullah khairan wa salam alaykum. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh uh, Hamza Yusuf. Um, I will not attempt to summarize the presentation, um, but probably to make a connection to the, to the topic of our discussion this evening, reimagining Islam uh, in the future. Uh, if one thinks that, now how is this related to the, to the theme, to the topic? And my attempt to make that connection in this way. One, the importance of the appreciation of language because that is the biggest miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that God has granted us. And not to underplay and underestimate the importance of language. After all, 
Quran is a language. Um, secondly, as Sheikh Hamza talks about appreciation of beauty and nature, now that is very religious. When we think of religiosity, we do not think only about rituals, forms, and hukum of ahkam. After all, you have less than 50% of verses in Quran pertaining to ahkam, the rest on ethics, on appreciation of beauty, and so on and so forth. So as Muslims, we need to think beyond simply requesting for our rights to, to exercise, uh, to practice the ahkam, but also to contribute to humanity, to contribute to, to, to green movement, and to minimize waste. I can tell you how much we waste when we have our walima, our, you know, when we get married. Uh, so, and that is very core, that is very religious, that is a, a, a theme, an objective that we need to contribute to humanity and to common good. And that is very religious, and that is the future of Islam, we hope, inshallah. Um, so without further ado, we have good one hour or so for this uh, conversation. Um, I'm giving you that time to, to again reflect some of the ideas that uh, Sheikh Hamza has uh, put forth uh, a short while ago. And also probably if you have some critical views of some of the, uh, the ideas that uh, uh, Hamza, uh, Sheikh Hamza has, uh, has uh, shared with us. So what we're going to do is to collect three questions uh, in one go, just so that we can give as many as possible the opportunity. Uh, and inshallah, uh, just uh, for information, Sheikh Hamza, actually, these are not just the people who are listening and watching you. There's a live feed at the other oh, end I because, didn't, I didn't know that. yeah, this auditorium cannot accommodate the number of uh, is interested. It, is it yeah. Live feed? Um, yeah, it's wired. So uh, the other end of the uh, building. Can anybody see it? Though? Oh yeah, yeah. Hi. <laughs> so they see. I wish they would have told me. That. <laughs> Yeah, it's good to know that you're not you're talking to a global, possibly global audience. Although we should always assume that now because everybody has cell phones and they film things. But you know, the Arabs used to say li kulli maqam and maqal. Every audience has its appropriate words, but that's not true anymore because now every we're, it's just get in trouble all the time for talking. <laughs> I'm I'm really thinking about just stopping talking at all because it's so difficult to speak now because everybody's offended by something and uh, you know we're losing the ability just to listen and maybe withhold judgment uh, and seek to understand there's so much now that if you say something somebody's going to be offended some group is going to be offended and uh, this mavlumiya the Arabs call it you know grievance theology Everything's, we're all grieving about something that's, I'm wronged. And there's a lot of wrongs in the world, I'm not going to deny that. But what I noted in reading the Quran was that the only character that's filled with blaming others is called Iblis. Um, that the, the, the prophets always look to themselves and the Quran tells people to look to themselves, to change ourselves. In Allah la ma bi ma bi anfusim. God doesn't change the conditions of a people until they change what's in their own souls. And what struck me about that verse, thinking a lot on it, I read a, a book by uh, uh, Nakib Arsalan the, that was called ma bi anfusim, which was written over a hundred years ago, and it's still very valid today. But that was his argument that that God does not change the conditions of a people until they change themselves. In other words, it's on God to change our conditions. It's on us to change ourselves. Now what we're all preoccupied with doing is changing our conditions, and we leave ourselves alone, and so the conditions just get worse. <laughs> yeah, so uh, what I'm trying to say... Uh Ladies and gentlemen who are at the other end of the room, uh, if you wish to ask a question, you can cross over <laughs> or probably pass a note to anyone of, of our, uh, our staff. They will assist, inshallah. In the meantime, in this room, 
any first taker, and if you wish, you can also queue so that we can first. I see two hands here, Zahid and Faisal, and also uh, Sam and Helmi. Uh, okay, the, the, the first group, uh, Faisal, let, let me just get uh, Faisal first, yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hanan and Sheikh Hamza. My name is Mohammed Faisal. Uh, I would like you to let, take us further into what you, you mentioned at the end of your speech. Right? The uniqueness about the Malay Muslims here is that first Islam came about 14th century, so we've been with Islam since 500, 600 years. Yes. So through that, we have built some sort of a consciousness yes. of who we are. Yes. But the, the uniqueness of our time now, to, especially to Singaporean Malay Muslims, is that we are in the juncture of meeting points of different civilizations. Mm -hmm. So we have the Arabs, we have the English, yes. we have everyone. Yes. Like, and we are connected to the world in that yes. sense. Yes. So what we had, and as an example of that, culturation happened, simulation happened and all that, something was lost in our, yeah, in our midst. Yeah, For example, one of that. the biggest things that, that disappeared from us is Jawi itself, which is the language of the Malays. And we have like 10,000 of manuscripts that are not read. And it is within the Islamic fold of Muslim writers that have written for all these centuries. Yeah. So how do we do it as Singaporean today? Mm -hmm. How do we take it to that next level? That's my first question. Sure. My, second, my second is that, and we have a lot of us here who are young Asatizas in a sense. So they are the beacon of our children in the future in that sense right. of bringing this faith. So what is your advice to? To the youth? To, to the youth who are the duans, yeah. who are the one who's going to preach Islam. Get Instead. off Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, the <laughs> well, they leave the Facebook, but they go to Twitter and Instagram. Well, it doesn't help. So. <laughs> you, you can tweet that out. Um, well, first of all, the, you're right about, I'm, undeniably, we, we can't be nostalgic about a past that's gone. I, I agree with that. Nostalgia, you know, the Arabs call it like uh, Hanin del Mali, you know, like just the, the Arabs have a poetry where they, they look at, you know, Qifa Nabki, you know, like just stop, let's cry over the remnants of what was here before. It's, it's, a, it's a very uh, Arab motif in a lot of their poetry. Um, and so we, we, we can't do that. Globalization is a reality, but the homogenization that much of globalization comes with is not a foregone conclusion. And that's why I think it's very dangerous uh, for cultures to allow this type of homogenization where you lose the distinctive qualities that make you uh, who you are. And, and, and this is, identity politics is very big right now for, 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 for the very reason that so many identities are being obliterated um, in the face of this, uh, of this globalizing force that's reimagining the world in its own image. Uh, much of it's still Western, and I'm, I'm a Western person. My own ancestors came from uh, Ireland and migrated to America in, in, uh, on, on one side, on, on my mother's Irish side in the 18, uh, 1760s, and in my father's side in the 1830s. The Irish were under uh, Br uh, English occupation for over 700 years, and their tongues were cut out for speaking Gaelic. And so the Irish no longer speak their language either. The Welsh are relearning Welsh um, because their language was taken from them also. So this is one of the sins of the past. I don't blame uh, modern English for this. And the English have a, an incredible contribution to human civilization. They have a lot of sins like any great civilization, but they also have a lot of incredible contributions. They uh, outlawed uh, uh, the transatlantic slavery. They were the ones that did that. They policed the, the Atlantic to stop the transatlantic slavery. It was people like Hannah Moore, incredible woman that everybody should know about, or, or William Wilberforce, or the Clapham 12. The, these were great people, and they, they were people of real sincerity, very often Christian, uh, motivated by their Christian belief. So I, I, the past is gone, and we're in the present, but at the same time, 
uh, you do have a culture, you have traditions, you have um, uh, ways of being that are your own, and, and they enhance you, they don't diminish you. And so it's, it's very important to honor those things. I think Singapore has far more to teach me than I have to teach Singapore, and that's the truth. I think this is, is an extraordinary uh, uh, example of human possibility. The fact that you have so much diversity in, in your ethnicities, and yet there's so much mutual respect. I mean, this is something stunning, and you should be incredibly proud of it, not in a way that makes you arrogant or feeling superior to other cultures, but in a way that, that I think places a burden on you to spread uh, this in other places that are suffering so greatly. I think you have far more to teach Arab culture right now than, than the Arabs have to teach you. I, I really believe this. And I love the Arabs. I spent much of my life studying Arab uh, language, Arab uh, culture, not just the Islamic aspect of it, but the pre-Islamic and, and, uh, and their literature that, that wasn't really Islamic. Um, and, and I love the Arabs. Hub al-Arab min al-Iman. And I believe that. I'm not a Shi'ubi by any stretch. But I think the Arab culture is in deep crises right now. And, 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 um, and I think that some of the things that you have done here are things that need to be exported to places like Syria, where, where for the f one of the great testimonies of Islam is that the great churches that were oppressed by the Byzantine church, which was my, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was Orthodox, so I was actually raised in the Orthodox tradition. The, the, the great church of the East was the Orthodox church, but it was very repressive. It oppressed the, the Chaldean church, the, the Nestorian church, uh, the, uh, the Ebionitic church, all these Semitic uh, traditions that ended up in India for some reason. So I think it's, it's really important to, um, to acknowledge that yeah. things have changed, but at the same time, uh, there are things that are constant in you. That w the word identity is from a Greek word which means the same. That's why we call identical, because it's what remains the same that gives you your identity. If you lose that quality, you lose your identity. So you don't want, I mean, one of the things the world is suffering from today is what I call spiritual Alzheimer's disease. They've forgotten that they have a soul, that we're not just matter, that we're also immaterial. And, 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 and this is something very important. In terms of the youth, um, the, the, the youth have challenges today that are unprecedented. In some ways, I, you know, my mother was at a, at a grocery store. Allah uh, she, she died last year, but she was, at a, she was 96 when she died. But, and she, when she was born, there was an Ottoman caliph. So it shows you, you know, it's amazing history. It's not that far uh, gone. But she was in a grocery store, and for some reason in America, at the, at the checkout, they put all these, like, National Enquirer and these weird, like, aliens in the White House. They have headlines that are very weird. And then they, so and this very old lady looked at my mother, who was very elderly at that point, and she said, Aren't you glad we're on our way out? <laughs> we don't want our youth to, to, to start thinking that. And one of the signs of the latter days is that young people are depressed when they get pregnant. That pregnancy should be a great joy. It shouldn't be a, a, a means of sorrow. Um, walk by graves and say, I wish I was in his place. And the prophet said, they have no uh, debt. You know, because debt used to really burden people. So he was saying that it's just from hum, just from stress. So we, the modern world is very stressful. And I think we're losing sight of important things like just sitting and, and having family dinners together and, and, and having tea. You know, tea, these human things that make us human are very important. And, that, you know, they, they say that nobody on their deathbed says, I wish I spent more time at the office. <laughs> you know, we forget about family and, and, and just being human. 
And this is something uh, that many traditional cultures really understood, just the importance of downtime, of just of going out and walking. Wa walking, walking is the biggest antidepressant we know, literally. Walking in nature is more effective than any antidepressant drug that we have. And you can read a Harvard study that was done showing this. Uh, Kierkegaard said, and he was very melancholic, he said, I, I was never depressed except I took a long walk and by the end of it I felt joyful. Just walking. I mean, we've, we've lost, we're humans. These legs weren't built for sitting around. <laughs> Thank you very much. As, as you can see, Sheikh Hamza has a lot to share. Uh, so what I'm going to do, if you allow me, Sheikh Hamza, to, to collect three questions, one go, and then probably you can respond uh, collectively. Probably they are related. So uh, I invite uh, uh Sorry, sir, can, can I get the ladies, the ladies first? Is there so, a woman? Uh, we, we've got a lady here uh, wanting to ask a question. <laughs> I'll invite you, and then after that, uh, Mr. Zayed, and followed by okay. Tan. Is it Tan? Yeah. Please. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum as -salam. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to, I looked at the word imagine, and then when I think about the word imagine, I think you have to be creative in order to be, be able to reimagine the role of Islam. And, and I, I started to think about the, the, the role of a creative minority in a community. The, the world created by? Creative the role, minority. The role of the creative minority. Oh, creative minority, like Toynbee's concept. Yeah, yeah. And, and I really like the idea of the creative minority because um, you've got to be, when, when, when you have when you have to reimagine a role of the future, you have to be creative and you have to be dynamic. And I feel that the voice of the creative di um, minorities is, is what's needed um, in, in a majority that's diverse like Singapore. However, when I was reading something, it says that um, uh, when, when, when you have to be creative, it demands a finessing of identities, which is exactly what we spoke about, how important it is to have um, a, a strong root with our identity. But it also says something along the lines of being being willing to be in a state of cognitive dissonance, so of cognitive dissonance. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if um, you could elaborate on what cognitive dissonance means when you are in a creative okay. minority. As I mean, when you have to be a creative minority sure. in a diverse community uh -huh. like thank Singapore. You. Okay. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Can, can I, uh, Zaid, if you can uh, be succinct and. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad Zahid from Muslim Youth Forum, Singapore. Uh, we've been reading your content of character for four weeks with youths in Singapore, alhamdulillah, 40 of them. And at the week three, one of them came up to me after my class and said that, don't you think that this is Sheikh Al Amin Mazru is Kenyan experience? Which he said that maybe... It's, it, don't you think? Don't you think that this is Sheikh Al Amin Mazru is Kenyan experience? Kenyan experience. Yes. Yeah. So he said that, don't you think that we need the content of character for Singapore itself? And then he was saying that, don't you think that some part of the hadith is out of context? Maybe. Mm. So that was the question. Okay. The, sec the second question is that, yeah. after this, could you sign my book? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, like, yeah, that was a trick question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, five okay. ten, please. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Muhammad Arif, and to provide you some context, I'm currently serving as the vice president of a local university's uh, Muslim association. So. Uh, Given, I think I have reasons to be thankful for uh, the existence of Muslim associations in local universities. Um, while there are probably other reasons to be depressed uh, as well. And given the uh, currently conflict-filled and unfortunately conflict-oriented uh, fabric that we have right now, um, what in Singapore or and, and just globally? Globally, and probably it trickles down to Singapore in, in some ways. Okay. Although there's generally peace. Um, how, how, what would be your key advice, or what would be one or two advice that would you, give, you would give to uh, those who serve the Muslim associations in local universities? Uh, what would be the guiding foundation um, for these leaders in Muslim associations? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, first question about the, the creative minority dissonance. and cognitive dissonance. Uh, creative minority is, is an idea that came, uh, as far as I know, I have 
the, one of the real experts here, Dr. Omar Abdullah Farouk, because he knows Tony B much better than I do, but um, I read the abridged version, he read the long version. Oh. But um, Toynbee argues that, uh, that societies rise and fall based on how they address the challenges that face them. And he argues that when they have a creative minority that is able to present to them uh, solutions to the challenges that face them, they're able to address those challenges and overcome those challenges. And then they'll be faced by a new set of challenges. This is the nature of the world. And so he makes this argument that it's very important for a society to have this creative minority. Now, one of the tragedies of a lot of modern society is the idea of elitism, that somehow intellectual elitism is seen as a negative thing that we're all equal. But just like we have world-class athletes and we honor them for their elite athletic abilities, we also have world-class musicians and we honor them for their elite abilities. Now, some of it is purely hard work and discipline, but it's often enhanced by uh, natural ability. Very often we fail to honor intellect in a society. In fact, because of envy, which is a major problem in the Islamic tradition, and envy was, it was one of the concluding remarks of the Quran, people of intellect are often envied for the gifts that God has given them. And so other people will try to keep them down or they'll attack them. And Kierkegaard said that people will admit a felonious crime before they will admit to envy. Envy is a real problem in societies. Cream should rise naturally, but homogenization basically uh, shakes it up so that the cream is not allowed to rise. And so it's very important to allow people to flourish intellectually and to honor that intellect. And, and if a society does that, and also it's very important for those who have been gifted with highly creative minds, that they maintain a humility from the Greek humus, which means the soil of the earth. Because every person, no matter how brilliant they are, is human, and they will be flawed. I learned from process working how important it is to put ideas before you articulate them, to present them to other people that, that you trust and honor, because very often they'll point out things that you didn't think of. And they'll show you the flaws in your own reasoning. And this is why collective fatwa is so important today for really major issues. Because one person, that burden cannot be put on the shoulder of one person. Amrahum shura bainahum. The Quran says their affair is of mutual consultation. So shawirhum fil amri. Consult them in affairs. And then once you decide to do it, do it. But consult people. The Prophet said, Mahaba min istashar. He will never. Uh, be destroyed or fail, the one who takes the counsel of others. And shara yashuru is a beautiful word in Arabic. It means to take honey from each of the combs in a honeycomb. That's what shura is. It's, it's taking the benefit of each person uh, and listening to them. And amazing, um, this famous um, business consultant in the United States who failed to convince American corporations, how important uh, his views were. He ended up going to Japan, and the Japanese adopted his model. And one of, the, one of his, uh, his points was to allow even the lowest employees to, to advise. And Toyota and others actually did this and implemented this. And very often, the humblest person can actually have a creative solution <laughs> to problems. Many mothers in America have become wealthy because they had some problem with baby carriage and they just thought, I wish that carriage had this. And instead of doing what most mothers do, is just saying, I wish this carriage had this, they actually ended up designing it and then it, it becomes the standard. Uh, Thoreau said, if you build a better mousetrap, 
then the whole world will, uh, will um, find a path to your door to, to get it. So creativity is very important. Now in terms of, of but reimagining or even imagining a future, you don't need to reimagine it. Imagine, because the Muslims haven't imagined a future yet, so let alone reimagine. Um, we're, we're imagining a past that never existed. It's a fantasy. There's never been an Islamic state ever in, 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 in Muslim history. There has never been an Islamic state. Medina was not a state by any stretch in terms of a modern understanding of what a state is. Medina was a, a, a Medina Fadira, like a closer to a kind of Greek city-state than it is to a dawla. When, when uh, Muslim became an empire, things changed and they adopted a Persian model uh, in many things. And so uh, this fantasy that a lot of Muslims have, Islam served empire. And many of the fatwas of the past were fatwas in service of empire and they're problematic. And Muslims did terrible things in many places. Uh, my friend Imam Zaid and colleague says when you read Muslim history, you have to take a lot of Iman vitamins. <laughs> Muslims did terrible things in India. Not always, but sometimes. Muslims, that we have our atrocities like every civilization. But we have this fantasy of the past that the Muslims were perfect. And wherever they went, they just brought goodness. And that's not always the case. Very often it was, but it's not always the case. And so we have to take the bitter pill of reality and not fantasize the past. But imagination is a very difficult thing when you're in an image-based society. Because traditionally, children were raised on words, on oral stories, on reading. And, and now they're raised on images, and so it stunts the creativity. We know that children that watch a lot of television have smaller corpus callosum than children that don't. We know that the brain actually is smaller. So the development, one of the things about television, there's only three basic colors on television. The world, the number of colors out in the real world is massive. And so all of this stimulates all of the, uh, the neural networking in the brain. Reading is very important. Listening is very important. Memorizing is very important. We've lost many of these things, so creativity is stunted. Now, the other thing that we've lost in terms of creativity is a, a recognition of how important it is to master a language. Robert Frost said, all of, of life is discipline, and the first discipline is the acquisition of words. We don't know what words mean anymore. We had a woman, I don't agree with what she, what she may have meant by it, but we had a woman in America who talked about alternate facts. Well, if you use the fourth definition of alternate in any good, of facts in any good dictionary, fact means allegation. That's one of the meanings of fact. So you can have alternate facts if you meant by the word allegations. And this is why juries in American law judge facts. The prosecution presents facts and the defense presents facts. They say on Friday at 11 p.m., my client was with his wife, so he could not have committed the crime. The prosecution says, that's not true. So he's stating it as a fact, and the other stating it as a fact, and so they're alternate facts. So which is true? The jury judges the facts, the judge judges the law. But if you don't know language, these nuances get lost. It's called fiqh al in, in the Arabic language. The Arabs would not call this a zujaja, they would call it a, a kas, because it has water in it. But if there's no water in it, like this, it becomes a zujaja. Those are distinctions that are completely lost on modern Arabs, let alone uh, uh, the English language. We've lost so much because we don't study words anymore. People used to study, if you open up any dictionary, there are multiple meanings of words in context. And the context changes the meanings of the words. So language is difficult. It, it takes hard work. They used to have grammar school where you had to memorize by rote lots of things. This is so, if we want creativity, we have to 
give our young people the tools of creativity. And finally, about cognitive dissonance, in a place like Malaysia, I mean, uh, in a place like Singapore, where you have multiple religions, you have different dress codes. Uh, the, the Muslim women uh, who, are, who are practicing very often dress in a very modest dress. There are other, uh, traditionally, all Asian cultures dress very modestly. In fact, the, the uh, CEO of Victoria's Secret, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but in America, it's a lingerie company um, that uses almost pornographic images to sell their lingerie. But uh, the CEO uh, wanted to open a shop in China, and, he said, and the, the, the interviewer for, I think it was Time Magazine, said to him, isn't the Chinese modesty, wouldn't that be a, a problem for selling Victoria's Secret in China? And he said, oh, that's nothing good ad campaigns can't deal with. In other words, there's a reason why they use a military term, ad campaign. Campaign's a military term. Advertisement, from the Latin, to turn your attention toward. Advertus, to turn your attention toward something. So. Uh, I, I just quoted a, a poem, I'll quote it again. Alexander Pope said, Vice is a monster of frightful mean face. As to be hated needs but to be seen. But, but seen too oft, familiar with her face. We first endure, then pity, then embrace. So there's a very slow process that erodes the morality of a people. But you should guard your morality because like the poet said, civilizations are nothing other than the character that embodies them. And when their character goes, they soon follow. And a fool and his culture are soon parted. So uh, cognitive dissonance, I'll just finish a long, I'm long-winded, I apologize. Cognitive dissonance um, is the idea that you have a belief and you have an action, and your action contradicts your belief. This creates a type of dissonance in the psyche, in the soul. And so there's one of two solutions to get rid of the dissonance. One of them is that you change your belief. And this is very often what people do. So you begin to justify their actions. The other is to change your actions. And so um, in, in, a, in a culture where you're dressing modestly and you're in a culture where other women don't dress like you do, for some people that can create a, a, a problem in, in the self because their religion is telling them to do something and yet outside people are doing another thing. And so the men have a hard time. Well, first and foremost, there's no time in Muslim history that you did not have half-dressed women walking around. And if you don't believe me, just look at the images of the Orientalists in, in uh, Egypt. Uh, even a hundred years ago, because a lot of what were called ima, their nakedness was not their tops, it was only from the surah to the rukba. And so there were women, Nubian women, walking around. Um, so this idea, this obsessive idea that we have to cover up our women completely and force upon them some kind of uh, codes and things like that. God says in the Quran, Qul min Tell the believers to lower their eyes. Why would that injunction be in there if there wasn't things to look at? If everybody's walking around in, a, in, a, in one of those beekeeper's bags, then why would you even have a verse that tells you not to do that? And I personally, and I'm not culturally sensitive on this issue, I personally think that putting a woman in something like that, to me personally, I, don't, I just, I have a really hard time as a Muslim. I have a hard time with that. And I know I was taught to be culturally sensitive in all these things, but I think women need to be honored. They need to be uh, not denigrated. I would prefer to see women honor themselves also. There are certain ways of dressing that can be very provocative and they don't help the men. And there are certain bestial men out there that will um, do things that are very troubling uh, to, to, to women. We have rapists, I mean, America, we have the, a problem of rape. So these are problems, but I would argue that you have to find ways of being true to your own principles and your own self without also demanding that other people be true to those same principles 
because we're all on this planet together and we have to learn to live with one another. In terms of the content of character, I would argue that um, those are universal hadiths and so I don't think they reflect just the Kenyan um, experience. Um, I, I really liked the collection and that's why I chose to translate it, but I do believe most of them are universal. Most of what the Prophet ﷺ said is universal. There are very few things that are specific to his culture. Um, for instance, a hadith من تشبه بقوم منهم, you know, whoever uh, ado- uh, imitates a people is among them. All of the hadith, and this solved a problem for me. There are many hadith about not being like the non-Arabs. Sidi al mawaq one of the greatest Andalusian jurists, said every hadith that tells Arabs not to imitate others is only for the Arabs. It's not for other people. And so any hadith that says, don't be like the ajam, it's that don't change your distinctiveness to imitate another people. And so it actually confirms the very thing that I'm saying, is that you should allow cultures to be distinctive and not try to impose other cultures on their behavior. Your, your advice to, to the young Muslims the, the la- oh, the la- the, Yeah, the last question about the... the, the um, I, look, I would say there are certain things that we would like to see. Um, I know, for instance, that you have uh, a khutbah that is, is written in the masjids. There are a lot of people that want the freedom to say whatever they want. Unfortunately, in this time right now, uh, in, in many places, this has caused a lot of the problems, spreading ideas that are very dangerous on the mimbar. And I've seen it with my own eyes and heard it with my own ears. And so um, I, my experience with the people that are involved in this is that they're very highly intelligent people and they're very well-intentioned people and I think they will probably provide very good um, khutbas that are beneficial. I went through a book of the khutbah of the Prophet that had been recorded. It's all in one book. I could not find one khutbah that mentioned anything political. Not one. I could find not one khutbah where the Prophet mentioned the grievances that they had towards the Quraysh or towards the other Arabs. All I found was exhortations about piety, about being better people, about doing this. If this is the khutbah of the Prophet, then why, are, why aren't you following the sunnah of the Prophet? If you want to talk about politics on the mimbar, you're going against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because he did not talk about politics on the mimbar. And so I think it's really important you know, to recognize that we're in a very sensitive time. And Islam right now is, is considered synonymous in the minds of millions of people. They estimate in the United States, 35 million people, that's 10% of our population, believe that Islam itself is a religion of terrorism. That is unacceptable. So there are many people that believe that Islam is a religion that incites violence, incites hatred. If you have imams with an utter lack of understanding of this religion's core principles, preaching or inciting hatred or denigration of other religions, that person has to be stopped because this situation has gotten out of hand. The Quran says, Do not curse the idols of the polytheists. So the Prophet Sallallahu people were commanded not to curse. Read the tafsir, that's what it says. Because they will curse God. In other words, you caused your God to be cursed by cursing their gods. And if you don't believe that's the case, then the hadith, which is a sound hadith, the Prophet said, do not curse your parents. And the Sahaba said, how could we curse our parents, Ya Rasulullah? And he said, by cursing another man's parents, and he curses your parents. So you caused him to curse your parents by offending his parents. So if you offend the religions of other people, you are breaking the sunnah of our Prophet and denigrating this religion. Our Prophet did not denigrate Hinduism or Buddhism or or Jainism or Sikhism or any other religion. Now, if you say, well, he destroyed the idols in Mecca. That's true. The Arabian Peninsula, the Hadith, according to Malik, that Hadith was specific 
to the Arabian Peninsula. He was restoring the Abrahamic tradition in Mecca because the, it, it was one man, Huyay, who brought the idols from Syria to Mecca. He was actually restoring the integrity of the house to the original intention that Abraham built that house with. So he was purifying the house. But we have no right to go into any country in the world. And if we're a majority we, and rule that country, we have no right to destroy the temples of those people. The Quran says in Surah Al-Hajj that, that يقاتلون يقاتلون قراءة, You know, that permission was granted to, to fight because they're being oppressed. Those who are being fought can defend themselves. And, if, and then Allah says, if that was not the case, you would see temples and, 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 and synagogues and churches and mosques where God is mentioned much being destroyed. So the very permission to defend ourselves was to defend multi-faith. And Islam is a religion that has always, when it has been understood correctly, has always protected other faiths right to worship and freedom of religion is one of the most important things that we have to spread on this planet as long as that religion is not calling to the destruction of other people at that point we have to say this is unacceptable and that's why things like ISIS have to be stopped because they're oppressing Thank you very much, uh, Shahamza. I, I would like to see more people on this side. If, if, if any time I see a, a woman, a lady wanting to ask God to give party to them, yeah, yeah. Uh, I make it clear uh, at the outset. Uh, so please, please uh, ask questions because you live longer, you see the future uh, longer than this side. But while waiting for you, uh, we've got a line here. Uh, help me. A quick one, help me. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah, Sheikh Hamza. My name is Ahmad Helmi. Uh, I'm asking on behalf of the, of the RRG. RRG is a rehab, religious rehabilitation group, uh, which is a group we do counseling and religious rehabilitation for, for those detained or involving in extremism or, and terrorism activities. So uh, this also uh, built up from the question posed by my father, Ustaz Asbi, uh, yesterday to Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya, with regards to Tasawuf. From your perspective, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, how can Tasawuf uh, be part of our rehabilitation work or counter-terrorism work? Or, or any other, uh, other than Tasawuf, any, uh, what else can be instilled to do this counter-terrorism work? And especially for the youth who, uh, with no religious uh, foundation, but eager to redeem their religious, uh, uh, redeem their Islam, Islam okay. because we have an increased number of youth who are involved in these uh, activities. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, I'll get read one. Was uh, actually uh, to be fair, Fizar was on, on the line, so I'm trying to be as just as possible. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala barakatuh. Alaikum assalam. Hello, sahlan, Shia Amza. Shukran. My name is Fizar Zainal. I'm from Bapa, and uh, we met in Kuala Lumpur last week. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> As we discuss on uh, the topic of reimagining uh, re the soul, uh, the role of Islam for the future, uh, my question is do we need um, to reconfigure the role and how we develop our future ulama or scholars? Which leads me to also ask what makes a scholar? in this time and age? And um, how do we also ensure, as much as we're trying to preserve on to the tradition of Islam, yeah. how we make sure it's relevant <coughs> with the changes that we're going through um, in today's context? Okay. It's, that's a, there's a lot in that question, but it's a very good question. Okay, yeah. um, the, yeah. the first question... Um, that, Use of Tasawwuf in the... That, uh, yeah, about Tasawwuf and extremism. Well, I would argue that more important uh, than uh, Tasawwuf per se is actually uh, an understanding of usul al-fiqh, 
um, because I think one of the major reasons that we're seeing um, these gross misunderstandings is that people don't know the nature of, of Sharia. They don't understand how complex and sophisticated Sharia is. And it's only through a, a knowledge of usul al-fiqh uh, that one can really acquire uh, a, a proper understanding of Islam. And I really believe that the basic fundamentals of usul al-fiqh should be taught in, uh, in Islamic education. It's very important. In terms of tasawwuf, uh, tasawwuf, uh, one of the problems with modern uh, quote-unquote Sufis is they've become extremely uncritical of themselves. And this, this has led to a reaction from other groups. And one of the things that Sufis uh, constantly do is they say, oh, those Wahhabis, if we could just get rid of them, the world would be perfect. Or, oh, those Ikhwan al Muslimin, if we could just get rid of them, the world would be perfect. But it's, it's just not the, the case. Um, the, the, the Salafi school actually emerged out of a lot of the decadence that was in the Hijaz. Uh, I mean, originally the Salafi school was from Egypt, um, but uh, what they called the Wahhabis, they actually called themselves the Muahidun. Um, but, but the uh, Salafiyah came, came to mean this school that is sometimes der derogatorily called the Wahhabis. Um, and now Sufis use Wahhabi for anybody that disagrees with them. They just call you a Wahhabi, which is a problem. Because the greatest critics of Sufism are the, are the great Sufis themselves. So I challenge you to read Ibn al-Banna al-Saraqusti in his last section in his famous poem, Al-Mabahit al-Asriya, called Fasl Fuqara Had al-Asr. Just read that, that section. عَاشِ بِهَا الْقَوْمُ بِخَيْرِ عِيشَةً فَصُورِيَتْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ مَعِيشَةً يُدْعَ الَّذِي يَمْشِ عَلَيْهِ سَارِكْ وَسَارِكُهَا الْيَوْمَ حِزْبٌ هَالِكْ That was, he died in 812 in, in, in Andalusia. And even though the whole book is about tasawwuf, the very end is a total criticism of the Sufis of his age, who he said were filled with innovations. He said, شُغِلُوا بِمُحْتَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ Right? So, where are the critics of tasawwuf from within Sufism? Because the Wahhabis, are, the, the Salafi people are criticizing the Sufis. The Ikhwan are criticizing the Sufis. All these other people are criticizing the Sufis. Where are the Sufi critics of themselves? Because our tradition is to blame ourselves. And so uh, if you think uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is a Sufi, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is the single most important Usuli scholar in the history of Islam. His book Al-Mustasfa, which was his last book, the Ihya was not his last book. His last book is a book on Usul al-Fiqh that is the basis of the Hanbali Usul. Rawdat al-Nadr, which is taught in Medina University to this day, is an abridgment of Imam al-Ghazali's book, despite the fact that many of the graduates of that school continue to denigrate Imam al-Ghazali, which is a problem. But Abu Hamid is an Usuli before he's anything else. And his tasawwuf is largely derivative from uh, Imam al-Qushayri and Abu Talib al Makki. In his book, in his risala called At-Tabyeen, Al-Kashf wa Tabyeen, bi anna jami' al-khalqi min al-maghrurin, revealing the fact that, that creation, that human beings are deluded. He said in that book, he, he gives the delusions of each group, the delusions of the scholars, the delusions of the businessmen, the delusions of, of these people. That, when he gets to the last group, they're called the Sufis. And he says, وَالصُفِيَّةً وَمَا أَعْظَمَ غُرُورَهُمْ And how great is their delusion. And then he says, they're deluded in the way they dress. They're deluded in the way they speak. That's Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. He is a critic of the Sufis. Imam Nasr al-Dar'i, who's in, 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 I'm blessed to be in his silsala. Muhammad Nasr al-Dar'i, from the great Zawiyah Dar'iyah in Morocco, wrote a book, Islah al-Zawaya, about all of the bid'ah that were in the Moroccan Zawiyas. And so the, the Sufis, they haven't reformed themselves. Ahmed Zarruq wrote a book called Qawaid al-Tasawwuf. He's another great critic of the Sufis. So if the Sufis don't reform themselves and everybody's saying, you know, look at the Sufis, how can the Sufis reform other people if they haven't reformed themselves? And how many Sufis now, these so-called Sufi sheikhs that, that 
uh, write talismans and charge people. I mean, we're, we're filled with this in the ummah, these people that trick other people. There are many people that go around in the name of tasawwuf, fooling people and taking murids and things. And this is not, I had some teachers that were great, I consider them great Sufis, but Ibn al-Banna says, if you want to know a false Sufi, it's the one that claims to be a Sufi. That's the first sign that they're not a Sufi. And I was in uh, America, and a, a beautiful Mauritanian scholar that we brought, who I consider a real Sufi, because the definition of a Sufi, according to Ahmed Zarruq, it has over 2,000 definitions, but all of them are sincere inner directedness towards God. That that's tasawwuf, sincere inner directedness towards God. And that means that a Salafi can be a Sufi, by that definition, if they have sincere inner directedness towards God. So uh, this sheikh came and we visited this man who was a, a, a Sufi sheikh. And, and when, 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 when we came in, he said, MashaAllah, Ahlan bi Sufi al Kabir. And my Mauritanian uh, teacher, who was, was well into his 70s, beautiful man and a scholar, said, A'udhu Billah, I'm not a Sufi. And he, he said, Astaghfirullah, do you deny Sufism? He said, no. He said, then why do you say, I'm not a Sufi? He said, in my country, a Sufi is the one that has no worldly matters in his heart. And the fact that at my age, I'm in America, is proof that I'm still after the dunya. <laughs> <laughs> the so, tasawwuf is very important in our religion. I believe that. It's, it's an important science. It's what we would call our psychology. It's to understand the soul. And there's two types of susim. There's what's called tasawwuf uh, al-adhwaq and tasawwuf al-akhlaq. Tasawwuf al-akhlaq is more important because you cannot get to the, the adhwaq without the akhlaq. And so the first stage of Sufism is called takhliya, emptying the soul of bad qualities. The second stage is tahliya, adorning the soul with good qualities. And the last stage is tajliya, where you begin to have spiritual experiences that strengthen your faith. Everybody wants the last stage without going through the first two stages. It's like people on an escalator. You know, in the old days, you had to walk up the stairs and exert yourself. Now the Sufism is just to be on the escalator and you move up on maqamat. No effort. So this is a problem. The secret of that takhliya, tahliya and tajliya is in the, the dot, the nuqta. It begins on the top of the ha-shaped letter, and then it's removed, which is the removal of arrogance, and then it goes on the bottom, which is humility. Whoever humbles himself before God, God will elevate him. Wallahu alam, and may Allah forgive me, but um, that's my view. Um. Before I pass off, for some reason, I think these questions come from ladies. Uh, okay. So I, I'll read these the, questions. The, the uh, testosterone does give some advantages in public space, but um, the, the ladies uh, should be honored uh, always. And yeah. if they're modest, I know uh, many the, ladies. We have, we, have, we have, there's a beautiful book by Susan Cain uh, called Quiet, which is about the importance of introversion. And the greatest... Uh, contributors to human civilization have very often been introverts. It's an important book. Never be ashamed of your shyness or your introversion. The Prophet وسلم, they said he was more modest than a virgin who was still cloistered. And so it's a beautiful quality and it should always be honored. And, and nobody should ever be forced to lose that quality if it's their natural quality. So the, the question goes, um, uh, Sheikhna, can we give an advice to young people in a society where Islam is put forward as a negative religion. What can we do as young people to do for the, for the religion? Um, another written question may not be directly uh, related. It's, it's about, uh, if I try to um, summarize this, uh, you're talking about us not stuck uh, to the, uh, uh, in the past. And, um, and I believe this issue is at the core of, um, okay, let me just, however, it is very hard not to allow the sequence of events that have happened in the past not to dictate one's decision. How does one break away from the past and let the future have a bigger influence on one's decision? But the question is, and, I'll, and I believe this issue is at the core of free choice. 
If one is stuck in the past, they, in essence, have no free choice and they are just going through the motions. So that is kind of, so probably your, your comment on that. Yeah, um, Bismillah. One, one, of, one of the things, uh, just about this first question, um, I'm, I'm in a country where Islam has been framed as a very negative thing, and even before 9-11, it was nowhere near as bad. Um, but after 9-11, uh, the Muslims did not do a lot um, because literally the vast majority of our mosques were covered with flowers the day after 9-11. There was so much goodwill. For every one negative call we got on the phone, we got 100 calls to the mosques, and we have recordings of this where they said, we're really worried, we heard people are attacking mosques, and, and that's, not wrong. that's wrong, if you need people to guard your mosque, we'll come. This is a fact that happened. But that goodwill was squandered by the Muslims becoming completely, and at the time, and Dr. Omar actually was there um, when, when we met in Los Angeles, and I said to a large group of Muslim leaders that we are going to be framed as a fifth column. I've been watching these people for a long time. This is 2001. We met in Los Angeles. I said, we are going to be framed as a fifth column in this country. They're going to present us as an evil religion and a danger to their civil society. And we need now to literally do something about this, to frame ourselves properly, give our narrative, not allow others to define us. Everybody said, no, 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 we don't want to go there. That's apologetics. We, we should just ignore it. This is called the Streisand effect. You know, Barbara Streisand, they took pictures of all these houses, you know, and, and, and put them on, online from aerial photograph. And so Barbara Streisand got really upset because it's a private house. She didn't want her house online like that. And so she um, sued the people. Well, because she did that, it got in the newspaper, and then everybody went to the website to see her house. So the very thing she was trying to stop ended up happening. And so they call that the Streisand effect, when, when you try to, you know, prevent something from getting out and you're doing it actually makes it get out even more. And so in some ways, Muslims uh, are guilty of not doing anything. Now the other thing, many years ago, Dr. Thomas Cleary, who's a brilliant Buddhist scholar in America, he's translated over 70 works from Chinese, a brilliant Chinese scholar. In fact, one, his Harvard professor said in an interview that what he knows in Chinese is equivalent to knowing about 50 European languages. Just an incredible genius. Um, and one of the things that he said that um, a Zen koan, the purpose of a Zen koan is to, is to awaken a, 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 a slumbered consciousness. Like when, when, when your mind is not thinking properly, what a Zen koan will do is, 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 is wake you up. Like if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him, right? That's a, that's a koan in, in Japanese Zen tradition. And, and so a Buddhist, like how do I kill the Buddha? It, it's about killing the idolatry in oneself and, 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 and our imagination of what we think the Buddha is. And so, uh, anyway, that's one interpretation. There are many interpretations for Zen koans, and I'm not a Zen master, so I won't go there. But um, Cleary said that you don't need a Zen koan to do this. All you have to do is ask the average American what they think of Islam. And you will hear somebody begin to spew the most prejudicial views. And if you ask them, have you ever read the Quran? Invariably, they say no. Have you ever read the hadith of the Prophet? Invariably, they say no. So on what basis are you judging the Muslims? Their religion? Well, it's what I read in uh, the New York Times about ISIS, or it's what I saw on CNN when they showed them blowing up some building or some uh, uh, suicide bomber. That's their view. So you judge a world religion with 1.7 billion people based on what the criminals of that religion are doing, when the Ku Klux Klan, which was a devout Christian sect in the United States, at the height of their membership in the 1920s, they were between two and five million people, according to uh, historical stats on, the, on their membership. So 
Do you judge Christianity by the Ku Klux Klan? Do you judge Christianity by what happened at Waco, Texas with the uh, Dravidian, se the Dravidian sect of uh, Koresh, who was a, a Seventh-day Adventist? Seventh-day Adventists are very uh, nice people. They're vegetarians, which doesn't mean you're nice. Hitler was a vegetarian. But generally, vegetarians are nicer than other people. I was once on a, I was once on a, uh, I had an airplane, and, and I called um, uh, to get a vegetarian meal. This is a true story. I called to get a vegetarian meal, and, uh, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's, it, your flight is tomorrow at 12 o'clock, and it's 12.05, and we need 24 hours to do, I said, what? It's 12.05. She says, sorry, the computer doesn't accept it at that time. Because I, I asked for a vegetarian. So I hung up. I was a little distraught because um, a long flight back to America. And uh, so my friend was with me. He said, no, 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 just call and ask for a kosher meal. I said, what? He said, yeah, just ask for a kosher meal. Trust me. So I call up. Same thing. And I said, um, can I get a kosher meal? She said, um, it, the flight's at, at 12. I said, yeah. She said, okay, fine. I said, well, why, why'd they do that? She said, uh, because vegetarians never complain. <laughs> yeah, so they just blow you off, you know. But meat eaters, now that's a different matter. Yeah, but, uh, about uh, uh, sticking to the past, free choice, sticking to past. Yeah, uh, that's quite a question. Um, I, you know, look, the past is important. Dr. Omar, many years ago, gave a talk called Qifu Haythu Waqafu Thumma Amdu. You know, s s stop where they stopped and then continue. Like, you have to know, it's important to know the past. I mean, history is a very important study. It's a study that's ignored. They say, uh, uh, Santayana, the great uh, philosopher, said those who uh, uh, don't remember, don't learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat them, right? And, and somebody added to that, and those who do learn the lessons of history are condemned to watch those who don't repeat them. <laughs> so it's definitely a problem um, uh, not knowing history. It's very important. We should know what happened in Bosnia. We should know what happened, because that can happen again. We should know what happened in, in the Holocaust. We, we should know uh, what happened with the Armenians. Um, uh, these are very complicated and painful issues, but they're important to know. But we should not make them the sources of a continued hatred that never ends. And I'll give you an example. Our Prophet وسلم, when he came to Medina, they had a day called Yom Bu'ath. And it was a day where the Aus and the Khazraj, two tribes in Medina from Kahlan, they used to fight each other, even though they were, they were cousins. And, and they actually originally wanted to bring the Prophet to be a peacemaker, which shows that at the essence of his message was bringing peace to communities. So he came as a peacemaker. But on the day of the Bu'ath, they went out and the Aus quoted their poetry and the, Asraj, the, the, uh, the Khazraj quoted their poetry. And it incited, they reminded that animosity and they started fighting one another. And so the Prophet came out and he, he told them to stop. And then he prohibited them from celebrating that day. And so it's very important that we don't turn these, these, these calamities of the past into this kind of constant memorialization. This is something in America that it's very tragic about um, certain things that have happened in the past that were very horrific. But the Quran says, Tilka al-umam qad khalat, laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum. Those people are gone. They have what they earned and you have what you earned. We can't dwell on what the British did um, uh, a long time ago. They're not the same people today. Those were different people. We can't dwell on what the Japanese did when they, when they occupied. Those people are dead. And these people have no blame. No soul bears the burden of any other soul. So you can't blame present people for the sins of the past. It's very important for us to remember that. So we have to know the past. It's important. Um, and we, have, we should learn the lessons of the past. But we also have to recognize that while there's much pain in the past, there also are great areas of, of incredible inspiration from the past. 
And I'll just give you, um, uh, you know, one example of that. Um, the, the, uh, the Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians, there are periods when they really, they did live together. It wasn't perfect. It never is. But there are times when they did live together, which means if they could live together in the past with all the baggage of the mentalities of the past, how can we not do the same thing today when we've been freed from so much of that baggage? My, my civilization was a very, very arrogant civilization. And in some ways, we still have some arrogance. I don't deny that. But there are many people in, in my country that, that they're reconstructed. They're, they're different people. They're not the people of America of the 1950s or 40s that hated Jews, that hated blacks, that hated Mexicans, that had derogatory names for them. When I was a very young person, there were still many names that I no longer hear anymore, like WAP and Spick and Mick. They used to call Irish people Mix. It was a, it was a derogatory term. You don't hear, I don't hear those type of words anymore. And if they're said, they're said in private because people don't accept them in public anymore. These are things that we have to honor, that we have to celebrate how far we've come and, and not constantly remind ourselves of how far we have to go. If we always are complaining about how bad it is today, then how do, how do, we, how do we encourage people to change? If it's all about grievances, how, how do we encourage people? And, and, and finally, collectivism is a disease. Don't, don't collectivize people. Our Prophet never collectivized a group. He looked at individuals as individuals. People should be judged not by the color of their skin or what group they belong to, but by the content of the character that they embody. And, and so when you see Muslims in Singapore, don't lump them all together as a group. There are good Muslims in Singapore and there are bad Muslims. There are Muslims that are, that are principled and practicing their faith, and then there are some that aren't. There are good Chinese in, uh, uh, Singaporeans, and then there are the bad ones. Every people has this. But don't lump them all together. Judge people by as individuals. And this is, this is our way. Our, this collective judgment on whole peoples is, 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 is so unjust to do that. So it's really important that we, we look at each other as individuals and let that individual uh, reveal himself to you through his character. If you want to change the negative attitudes, stop complaining about attitudes and start being good, decent people. Really, start being good, decent people. Serve your society, volunteer. Do things, and not simply for pragmatic reasons uh, of public relations. Public relations used to be called propaganda. It was a great propagandist named uh, uh, Bernays, right? Edward Bernays. He changed the name from propaganda because the Nazis gave it a bad name. And, and, and the Catholic Church used to call their, their uh, missionary work propaganda. So it used to have a positive term. It doesn't anymore. PR is propaganda. Do things because it's the right thing to do, not because you want to get some kind of public relations uh, boost from it. Now, this is very difficult for me to imagine my next five minutes and reimagining the next five minutes because I only have five minutes and I've got a long queue here, right and left. Uh, I don't know. I, I, didn't, I cannot imagine my future. Five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, so what, what I'm trying to do now, um, a very quick one, a lady here. Uh, I know Ridwan has been standing there for almost uh, half an hour. Uh, I'll please give a quick one, no more than one minute, okay. straight to the point, okay. then I'll move to Ridwan. Yeah, quick one, please. Okay, I would like to ask about political Islam. So Can you speak louder, please? I would like to ask about the role of political Islam. So, regarding Islam in the future. Yeah, yeah, about what? Political Islam. Political Islam, uh, okay. Uh. On the relevance of politics in Islam. So, for example, arguing about having an Islamic state, Sharia law, Hudud, is there any role Islam can play or should play to revive or reinstate, or Islam got nothing to do with all these things? Thank well, you. Well, that's require yeah. one day conference. Can I yeah. quickly okay, answer that? Just quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, uh, 
we, we, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya in this very same auditorium the other day said we don't deny anything about Islam. We don't deny anything. Our, our Islam, the Quran says jahidu. You know, we don't deny jihad. We don't, none of these things we can deny. But what, what is important is that there, there are, there's a certain very small section in any Islamic text called um, hudud. It's the smallest section of any Islamic fiqh book. The largest section is Tahara and Salah, and, and, and uh, the, the commercial law, divorce and marriage. Th these are all civil um, uh, aspects of Islam. The smallest is called Hudud. Out of all the Hudud in Islam, there are only five, and arguably only four, that are agreed upon. All of those are called Ahkam Sultania. They have nothing to do with common Muslims. Nothing. They are the prerogative of, of the government of a Muslim state. And that government can suspend the hudud for maslaha. And this is simply a fact. The muftis here, I'm not making this up. This is our religion. Iqamat uh, al-hudud takhtassu bil-sultan. This is a qaida in fiqh. Establishing the hudud is the prerogative of the government. That's, a, that's a, 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 an accepted principle in our jurisprudence. And so the hudud are not the concern of common people. It's the concern of the government, and, and penal codes are solely the prerogative of a government. Vigilante justice does not exist in Islam. If somebody curses the Prophet, whether in public or private or any situation, no Muslim can take the law into his hands. No Muslim. It is prohibited. This idea of, of sentencing people to death because they express their views. Our Prophet ﷺ listened to the worst things said about him. In fact, they called him Mudhammam, which means blameworthy. It's the opposite of Muhammad. And when he heard it in Sahih Bukhari, when he heard that, he said, Ajiban, sarafu ismi an al sinatum You know how wondrous God has removed my name from their tongue. They're talking about somebody called Mudhammam and my name's Muhammad. He didn't give it any reality. If you think those cartoons were pictures of our Prophet, you're not a Muslim. You're not a Muslim. If you say that's a picture of the Prophet Muhammad, you're not a Muslim. Because we, nothing, the Prophet cannot be denigrated. Our Prophet cannot be denigrated by picture. There's no picture of him. We have no picture. We have a description of what he looked like and it's all beautiful. And so any picture, there are pictures historically in the Shia tradition, some pictures were done of Hussein and others. There are always beautiful people that have beautiful qualities because our Prophet ﷺ was beautiful, is well known. He was the most beautiful person. So th those are not pictures of our Prophet ﷺ. You know, there's a famous uh, picture by Magritte. It's a, a, a pipe. And then it says, this is not a pipe in French. People had a hard time understanding that because they don't differentiate between an image of a thing and the actual thing itself. The image is not the thing. And that's like a Zen koan. It's to wake you up and make you think. So we cannot take the law into our own hands. Is it wise to implement the hudud today? That's the prerogative of a government to decide that. But many states become pariah states when they do. Um, so it's, it's something that is not my purview or your purview or, or anybody else's. That's, that is for the government to decide what they do with the penal codes. That's my view, and Allah knows best. May Allah forgive me if I said anything incorrect. But that, that's my view. And, and, and I think it's important for Muslims to really learn to implement the sharia of, 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 of tahara, of salah, of tazkiyah, of, of, of zakat, of, um, of marriage, honoring women in marriage is haram to, to domestic violence is haram. That's sharia, stop domestic violence. That's implementation of sharia. Mm. Uh, sound commercial laws, that's implementation of sharia, not uh, exploiting people or cheating people. That's all sharia. Why do you limit sharia to this one small section of a book that has nothing to do with you? when you're not implementing the other things. This obsession of modern people about this is very strange in my estimation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Rivran, I, I must apologize, guys. I, I know that you've been standing there for almost half an hour. 
and, and, and the line here, but we are really, really running out of time. Uh, so I, uh, please forgive me and pray for my future, inshallah. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I think we will have to, we, we really have to call it a day. Uh, Shah Hamza has been talking since morning, very early in the morning. Uh, Interpreting too, which is and, <laughs> very tiring. So. Yeah, so I, I, I will have to end the, the interesting conversation uh, this evening here. Uh, you are rewarded, inshallah, for, uh, for your effort, uh, waiting for the opportunity. So, uh, personally and on behalf of Moose Academy, I would like to record our greatest appreciation to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf for making his time and for all his um, effort and uh, his thoughts has been shared with us a lot of things. And um, I must also thank every one of you for making your time and patiently listen to, to our conversation for, for the past two hours or so. And please join me in thanking Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, uh, who has been us for the past few days. <laughs> I, I really thank all of you for your patience and uh, please excuse me for my long-windedness. Um, I, I would just like to say that um, I really feel like I have a lot to learn from all of you. I haven't come here to teach you Islam. You have had Islam for many centuries here and it's a beautiful Islam. What I see here is a beautiful Islam and may it be preserved, may you be protected from any bad ideas. Uh, from other places that have no relevance for you and, 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 and will only harm you. Uh, may your young people be protected uh, and, and may God protect this island and protect the, the people of Singapore and uh, all the people and may he protect all of their places of worship and, and may he give guidance to the government and wisdom to I mean, do the right thing and, I mean. and to um, to, to be sources of flourishing and goodness for your society. Oh, and, I mean. and may he uh, always, uh, you, you have, um, your, your, your national motto is Onward Singapore. Majura, Majura, Majura Singapore. Yeah. So, Onward Singapore. Assalamu yeah. alaikum. Uh, salam to Allah. <laughs> just stay here since the beginning. Uh, can I invite Shamim, please? Thank you. Thank you, Sheikh Hamza and Dr. Hanan. It was an, indeed an enlightening talk and um, a refreshing discussion. Do you agree with me? Yes, mashallah. May we all benefit from the lecture and exchange of ideas. If I can request both um, Sheikh Hamza and Dr. Hanan to remain on stage. Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure now to invite President of MUIS, Haji Muhammad Alami Musa, and Chief Executive of MUIS, Haji Abdul Razak Marika, to present a token of appreciation for Sheikh Hamza. is a natural mokara orchid plated in palladium and 24 karat gold. Mokara orchid is a hybrid vanda flower created in Singapore in 1969. This hearty hybrid has a unique flower shape and produces blooms in many colours. Hope you like it, Sheikh Hamza. Sheikh Hamza, Dr. Hanan, President Alami, and also Chief Executive Abdul Razak. And thank you to our um, um, beloved Sheikh for enlightening our minds and souls. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our program. May we leave today's event feeling enlightened with a better grasp of the role of Islam and other faith traditions in shaping the common good that benefits all humanity, inshallah. If you enjoyed the session and wish to be part of other engagements, please follow us on Facebook for updates. Alternatively, you can fill your contact details in feedback form. Your feedback is important to us and we appreciate if you could take some time to fill it out. Our ushers are around to help you. Thank you distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen for being part of this event. May we meet again in the near future inshallah. I wish you good night and have a pleasant journey home inshallah. Wa billahi tawfiq wal hidayah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.